our protein. So yesterday when I left you, we were in the middle of a protein purification and we were exhausted. It had been a long day and our protein was doing dialysis. And so basically dialysis is where you can like remove extra salts and stuff. And so we had purified this protein um, from a recombinant expression. And so basically we stuck the instructions for making the protein we're interested in. In this case, it's malic dehydrogenase, which is this critical metabolic enzyme. And we are studying the malic dehydrogenase from a bacteria called Bacillus defensis that we're interested in for bioremediation potential. So basically it can clean up the environment. More specifically, we're interested in kind of like it removing metals. And we want to study how it's like metabolism is helping with this process. And so we want to study this crucial metabolic enzyme, malic dehydrogenase. And so instead of trying to purify it out of the bacillus defensis, we put it into bacteria that are really, really good at expressing proteins for you and even modified proteins. So we stuck it into E. coli cells and we stuck the instruction for making that with a histidine tag on the end. So basically a string of the amino acid histidine, which let it bind to a nickel coated column, um, resin in a nickel column. And then we let it flow through. We let other stuff come out and then we wash and wash and wash and wash and wash it. And then we add a midazole, which mimics the histidine. So the part of the protein that made it stick to the column, we add something that looks like that. And so to push our protein off. But then we push our protein off and it's with all this amidazole, all the salts and stuff that we want to get rid of. And so we take that out. So basically the dialysis, you have this little pouch, this membrane pouch. And you choose a pore, thick, pore size of the pouch so that your protein cannot come out, but the salt can come out. And the, so basically the salt comes out and anything that you want to go in that's small enough can go in. So we took the salts out, we took glycerol in. So glycerol is gonna help us with freezing it um, and help keep it protected. Basically, if you think about a protein, you might think about something like hard clump, but really what a protein is, is more like a roll of yarn. And if you think about, or a bowl of spaghetti, except it's like all one spaghetti strand usually. So what happens then is if you go and you freeze your spaghetti and the marinara freezes, well, when water freezes, it expands. And so you don't want water to expand inside of your protein. And so the glycerol is gonna help cryoprotect it. It's gonna protect the protein from crystals forming. So from those like the water kind of expanding inside of your protein and then your protein cracking and you have like cracked spaghetti, soggy pasta, I don't know, whatever you want, whatever analogy works for you, you don't want that to happen and so the glycerol helps with that. And by dialysis, you're able to kind of do this. Um, you put your protein in the pouch and then you put the pouch in a lot of liquid and so you put the pouch in a big thing of liquid overnight in the cold room. And so that's where we left our story last night. And well, one thing that I was really, really worried about, it was like, keeping me up all night well not really keeping me up all night because I was so exhausted but what I was really worried about was something that can happen often with proteins is that you take them out of this high salt environment where they're happy like you know they're soluble right then but then you if you like dialyze it and you're trying to change the buffer you're trying to take out the salt and things what can happen is that then the protein crashes and so when the protein crashes, basically what this means is it precipitates and it aggregates. And so what you take is you take this thing that you had in there and it was all nice and pure and you have all this enzyme and then you go and basically what happens is that you have, um, it, it would precipitate out, you get like this clumpy stuff in there. But instead what we saw was that we came in this morning and woo, it's clear, it's clear, it didn't precipitate. All is good with the world. And so all is good with the world in terms of our protein. Um, and, but then we wanted to do another dialysis. So I stuck it in another bottle. Basically with dialysis, the little things are coming out and the big things are staying in. Um, and as the big little things come out and the big thing, the little things go in, you reach this equilibrium between the things going out and the things going in so that the concentrations are the same in each. So we're trying to remove all of the imidazole. But if we remove, like, that's why we have this, if we have a large volume, the final concentration of imidazole is going to be really, really low, but it's not going to be like zero. But if you then remove that buff, that whole buffer and put it in a fresh buffer, well now more of the imidazole can come out. And so basically you do another buffer, you exchange the buffer that the dialysis was happening in. So the larger volume you have, the more um, like swaps out of the, the liquid you have, the better. The more imidazole that can actually come out. And so that is going to be what happens. As that comes out um, and your protein stays in, 
then you're still, you're just hoping and hoping and hoping that your protein stays in solution as well as stays in the bag. And the bag is easier to control because you just choose a molecular weight cutoff. So basically the size of the pores, that's like not gonna let your protein out. And so much more on that in other posts, but basically your protein can crop out sometimes, but thankfully ours did not. So that was test number one. Well, I guess for the first test was, does it express? We saw that it expressed. That was the whole like auto injection thing. Then we said, okay, well, can we purify it? And well, we got some protein yesterday, but we didn't have time to run a gel to see if it was actually pure. And then we said, okay, well, let's, let's see if it can survive the night. Can it stay soluble as we do this buffer exchange to what we want it to be in for when you freeze it? Yes. So we're really excited. And then the next test is, is it pure? So we expressed it, we know that. We purified some protein, but is it actually really pure? Is that actually even our protein? The way that we could tell this is by running an SDS page gel. And so that is what this beauty that I was showing you is. Now my student Nicholas says he's never purified proteins, but look at that band. Look at that nice fat band at the end. Basically, what an SDS page gel is, is it's, so, okay, so some people, uh, I found that students call like the agarose gel electrophoresis, like the DNA gels, like normal gels, because that's what they learn first. So lots of my students are like, oh, you mean like a normal gel? And that to me, like that's like the, not the normal gel because I'm way more used to doing protein gels. But the basic idea is the same, is that you take molecules and you send them traveling to, through a membrane based on their electricity. But with an SDS page, you kind of have this, um, this thin sheet rather than a thick slab. And it's going to be vertical rather than horizontal. But the bigger things travel slower, the smaller things travel faster, and they separate by size. You can see here that basically in this first lane, that's going to be, um, that's gonna be like what is our supernatant from when we did the expression and then, and then we broke the cells open and we spun them down. That's what's going on the column. And so uh, what's on the column, you see that a lot of stuff is going into the column and that's the flow through. So you can see that there's some of our protein in that flow through. We probably didn't have enough resin in there, um, not enough beads. We had way too much protein for that amount of beads, um, but we didn't know that it was gonna express like such a beast. Um, and so then you see a wash, wash. Um, that's the last wash before it actually goes, we actually start adding like more imidazole. And so you can see that we basically got rid of the st most of the stuff in the wash. And then we start up in the imidazole. We start up in the imidazole, we found that in basically these two fractions, where we're about like 50 to 100 millimolar imidazole, our protein started coming out. And then it was a little in the next fraction, but not enough to worry about, especially because then we just have more imidazole we'd have to get rid of and we'd have a larger volume. But so we combined those four and five, those, those fractions that we liked. And oh my God, look at that big fat band. What you, what's really cool too is there's not, I mean, there's a little other bands, but really barely anything, especially compared to that big fat band. So we're super diverse sided. And in fact, kind of like the biggest problem we had was the volume, the sheer amount of protein that we had. We had 15 mils of this bad boy, 15 mils. And the thing with enzymes is you don't want to like freeze thaw them a lot. So we had glycerol so that it helps them like not like explode and not explode, but like crack open or whatever when we go to freeze them. But with an enzyme, you want to make sure it maintains its activity. And so you don't, you want to avoid freeze thawing it so sometimes you, can, you can't even get away with free sawing it once, but more than once is really pushing it. So we, didn't, we knew that we wanted to freeze this enzyme so that we could use it in the future, but we also knew that we only are gonna need a little bit of it each time. So what I did was I aliquoted it and basically aliquots, you just make really tiny little portions. And I did that 15 mil worth in 30 microliter aliquots so I basically put my protein in a deep well block, um, like the, a large amount of it in the wells of all across on ice, then took a multi-channel, transferred that into pipette, um, PCR tubes in a cool rack. Turns out five racks of those. Um, and then what I did was I went and I put them in liquid nitrogen. So the glycerol is gonna help it um, kind of not break open. But the other thing that's gonna help is to freeze the water inside of it really, really fast. And so let me just pull up that picture. Basically, yeah, so basically I put the micro pipette into there and then I froze it in liquid nitrogen. 
And then I stuck that in the box and I have like an Oodles life size supply of enzymes. Now this would be great if the enzyme was active, but what if it weren't active? In fact, I didn't even do this part until we wanted to check whether or not it was active. And so basically it would be a lot of, it was a lot, a lot of work to do all that. And it would be a lot, a lot of work to do all that for nothing if the enzyme wasn't active. So when we talk about malate dehydrogenase, its activity is basically, it can go back, it's a reversible reaction between malate, um, malate plus NAD plus is going to give you oxaloacetate plus NADH. So in that direction, you have basically this oxidation of malate to give you oxaloacetate with the reduction of NAD plus to give you NADH. Now, it turns out that in vitro, the other direction is way, way, way more favorable. So it's a lot more favorable to go from oxaloacetate um, plus NADH to malate um, plus NAD plus. And it turns out that NADH you can actually measure with UV, <coughs> sorry, at um, 340 nanometers wavelength. And so you can monitor the decrease in the NADH absorbance over time in order to measure the MAD, MDH activity. And so this was what we were trying to do and well we were having issues with the software but our protein was super active and so how do i know basically we were trying to set up a time course to do at 340 nanometers and what happened was we couldn't get it to do a time course but we did get it to do a single measurement and if we um <clears throat> sorry if we zoom in basically that green peak that was when i just measured it with just the with just the nadh and the rest of the buffer solutions and that's the 340 peak for the NADH. When we added the enzyme, we mixed it really, really quick and we took a measurement. And by the time we took a measurement, all the NADH was already gone. So we're definitely gonna have to measure, dilute our enzyme. In fact, we've been made a series of dilutions for our enzyme, but then we couldn't get the software to work. So we're trying to get the software to work. Huge thanks to everybody in the malate um, dehydrogenase cures community for, your hiring, for, ah, for trying to help us with this and for helping all along the purification process. As I have a bazillion pro uh, questions, just to make sure that my students have the absolute best chance possible for this protein to work. We found this protein works. We've got it in the freezer. Now we have a big mess to clean up and I'm tired again.